So I'm talking about G-Visor. Has anyone used it yet or looked at it or seen it? Uh, anyone on GCP running Python 3.7? Um, great. Uh, so who am I? Uh, at the moment, I work for an insure tech company. We build the insurance app. We're going to launch it soon. Um, a little bit of... Uh, JavaScript madness and Python going on. Um, what I do otherwise, which uh, might be more interesting to some, and I'm going to um, be another security guy talking today. So, uh, uh, besides Cape Town, uh, to give you a little uh, idea of what we do, every December we have a conference. Uh, we do cool stuff like build badges. Um, the badge builder might be here somewhere. Um, he's the same guy who built the Monero badge that went to DEF CON this year. So we do an InfoSec conference. Uh, we have a lot of fun. We also run a Wasp Cape Town. And we're always looking for speakers. Um, so containers have had some fun the last year or two, uh, partly because we're human and we download MySQL. That's not the standard one on the Docker Hub. Uh, but we've also seen uh, Monero, even malware running on Docker already, and throw in uh, pip and npm getting hit as well. And you've got a really lovely time of trying to keep the host uh, separated. So generally, uh, we know this kind of uh, look where you've got a VM to uh, protect the host kernel and you're running a guest kernel. We know that it's... Um, not always great for performance, hence why Docker came along a lot more lightweight and performant. Um, so fortun unfortunately, sometimes Docker gives us this um, kind of situation where the application's much closer to the host kernel, especially if you're running it as root. Um, and potentially, you jump around uh, and find other containers, especially in a multi-tenancy environment. So uh, where a lot of my kind of interest started with this is looking at how would you actually build Lambda or cloud functions from scratch. And um, someone actually put a uh, Lambda function online with a, a JavaScript page that you could directly just inject commands into his Lambda function and still uh, it was actually quite difficult to break out. Um, he actually just left it there for months. Um, so uh, GVisor, um, so the security um, warning always is we're going to talk about performance getting a hit. But GVisor puts a little shim in between the application and the host kernel. Um, that's kind of what it looks like. It's two Golang um, services running, one proxying um, syscalls. So what they've done is they've implemented around 200 of the 400 plus Linux syscalls. And they've looked at specific uh, applications that would um, support that. They've been running it in the internal infrastructure for years. They've now uh, moved it out as open source and onto GCP. Um, and uh, the kind of two things that it separates is syscalls and the network. It has its own network stack that it spins up um, in a user space. They kind of call it a user space kernel. Um, so there is some kind of performance hit because it is like a VM. It's uh, translating syscall to syscall via Golang. So at least um, Golang and Secure gets thrown in uh, to their documentation. Um, so they've got Sentry and Gopher, um, but they also allow network pass-through. So for very high intensity network uh, applications, you can skip their own network stack. Um, adding it to Docker is actually quite trivial. Um, they give you an example. So the example I've taken is the one with the debug uh, logging and S-Tray. So you can actually see if your application's working. Um, you download a, a Linux, uh, uh, yeah, maybe just to mention this, it is Linux based, it's 64 bit focused. Um, so any 32 bit application and non Linux um, app is not going to work. Um, and you obviously want to run it on a Linux host. Um, and then 
Uh, it is a Golang static binary. All the dependencies are in it. So you just download the binary, put it into a path. Um, and then also, if you want the log directory, you state it. Um, so I hope everyone can see. Um, so when you actually come to using it, um, because they're following the uh, uh, OCI um, spec, you add it as a runtime argument and it runs. So this is a Alpine Linux Python 3.7 container that I built for this purpose, um, why I even started looking at it is I, uh, I'm doing a lot of Python 3.7 um, work with uh, UV loop, which is a um, async IO, uh, asynchronous event loop uh, replacement for the normal async IO in Python. And it uses the same uh, kind of underlying event loop as Node.js. So it's a kind of a crazy environment that might break something like this, but I've actually f um, found so far that I haven't been able to break it with this except if I uh, control C. So some of your uh, syscalls uh, aren't working yet. Um, in terms of Kubernetes, uh, it's still very much work in progress. So they've used it internally. They still work working on actually making it work properly in Kubernetes. So some of the problems with uh, Kubernetes is one container per pod at the moment, except for the continuously paused pod, uh, ugh, container in the pod. Um, they're working on the networking, literally in the code, they have comments of remove this later when we do multiple containers. Um, supported applications at the moment, we're looking at everything from Jenkins, um, our friend's favorite uh, little uh, CI tool, Prometheus, is already working with it. Uh, for myself, Elasticsearch is a good sign. Golang and Python and Node all run in it. Um, and another kind of knock-on effect with this is that it's also great for sandboxing malware. So um, at Rhodes, I'm doing my masters, and uh, we've been looking at malware recently, and more and more uh, people are looking at Docker instead of VirtualBox um, uh, for malware, obviously not Windows malware, but uh, who doesn't like to screw up a Windows machine and VirtualBox every now and then? Um, so uh, another great feature it has is that it can checkpoint and restore a running container. So you um, checkpoint it and you can actually move it somewhere else. So if you have found malware, you take it somewhere else, run it up and look at uh, what you found um, rather than just destroying it and continuing on. Um, there's a company already working on what they call Honey, um, honey Trap, uh, where they're adding a module to use GVisor to run uh, malware in it um, as a honeypot. Um, and for the most part, just to show you that a actual application with a crazy amount of Python modules uh, works as advertised. So um, to show you when, when you've got the debug logging on, it is uh, rather useful. Uh, so uh, I had Stacktrace earlier just to show that it's pretty much uh, very similar to Stacktrace. They actually call it Stacktrace in uh, in the code, so they've implemented um, stack trace logging um, as you expect it, and you can track um, all of your syscalls in your container while it's running. So um, as they say themselves, it's still very experimental, so you should probably run um, your container for a little while and check that everything's working before you actually take it to production, which I'm doing at the moment. Um, and just to show you that that doesn't work, so I've already uh, found something uh, that I'm going to avoid in the future. And I think that, is that 50 minutes? Close? Say again? Oh, goodness. Um, <laughs> so I actually found it quite difficult to cram it into 50 minutes, and I've managed it into 10. Um, 
but um, what I will say is if performance is your main uh, focus on Docker, then this will probably be a bit of a pain. It has an overhead because it's translating syscalls, it's running to uh, Golang um, processes to do all of this and intercept everything, uh, much like SecComp and AppArmor and uh, EC Linux, it does kind of, a, it, it's building on a, a fine-grained uh, execution uh, and it actually uses SecComp to some extent to block um, dangerous syscalls and you will find that some syscalls, uh, for instance, Postgres at the moment is not supported because of one syscall that it's not implemented yet because they haven't used it uh, before, so they're working on that. Um, so, in general, what it's trying to do is it's trying to uh, lessen your footprint of potential syscalls that could be a problem. Another thing it's trying to prevent is, for instance, if you're running Docker's root and you um, also running the network of the host, you could potentially hit the Docker daemon itself if it has a vulnerability. What this allows you to do, even if you're running as root, it's running in a separate uh, namespace. Um, with a network stack. Um, also, it's, um, the namespace prevents it from just heading back as a uh, root into the host. And that's kind of the magic of it. So you'll hit a performance degradation to some extent, but in general, um, if you're especially using Kubernetes in a kind of uh, multi-tenant environment and you wanna prevent containers uh, hitting each other, this would be the way to go. Questions? for three minutes. So, uh, quick warning, I'm not using this in production yet because I'm still testing it. I wanna be sure that everything works, um, especially the async stuff in Python. Um, I am running some uh, experimental async stuff, to be honest, so I will be testing it much further before it goes into production, and I'd love to see what it looks like in a Kubernetes cluster with multiple containers in a pod in the future. Questions? The um, performance set, what's the order of magnitude? 1%, 10%, 100%? Um, so they haven't measured it yet. Um, if I remember correctly, their claim to fame is that I think it's only a 25 meg binary. Um, so in terms of a full hypervisor, um, Rather than 20%, we might be looking at 2 to 5%. Um, they are, um, in their documentation, they talk about running multiple threads and using as much of the host resources as possible. But I think that's where they're running into the problems with Kubernetes, is managing uh, multiple containers across pods with um, the resources not being flooded by Golang itself. So... Um, because they're only doing 200 syscalls, they're not uh, virtualizing all the hardware. Um, I would, I, I'm still busy testing it, so I'll, I'll, if you follow me on Twitter, I'll, I'll tell my version of it at some point, but I would guess between two and 5% performance uh, hit. And, and considering that it has its own network stack, um, obviously that's an overhead as well, because you're hitting uh, their network stack uh, the host network stack and potentially um, whatever other, um, like in Kubernetes, if you have any crazy routing, um, I, I have no idea how that would impact it as well. Cool, one more question. Hi. Um, would you be able to give uh, your thoughts around kind of the, the, the road forward, if you will, between uh, user space kernels and uh, uni kernels? Ah, uh, that, that, was, uh, that was something I was thinking about when I was working on this. So, um, wow, that is an emotive question. <laughs> so, I need that shirt. Where is he? Um, but uh, if you actually look at what they've done, it is kind of a unikernel in of itself. Um, uh, how would I... Um, it is, it is a kind of a weird space. You, you're sacrificing quite a bit of security for a potential, uh, a, quite a bit of performance potentially for a lot of potential security because they're only implementing part of the syscalls. They're only using 
SECOM to a certain extent. Um, and I, I'm not honestly sure if unikernels are the way to go because now we're just adding more and more to the stack. Um, where Docker, the point was that we're trying to remove all of the virtualization as much as possible. So um, maybe we should look at more something like um, Node.js has V8, so the language itself is a sandbox. Um, this is a situation like trying to protect Python that isn't fully sandboxed in the first place. So uh, I suppose your, your environment's important. I don't think unikernels are or the way to go, even if I look at this, some of it is insane, but it's a good idea at the same time. <laughs> Hello. Thank you.